Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come before you right now, first of all, foremost, just in Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving, uh, that everyone is well, that it, though we've been out of pocket and uh, out of stride, Lord, that you you are still being you. You're still doing what you do, and you're still showing up for us. You're still listening and available to us. You're still working on our behalf, and we just say thank you. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you just come here in each of our respective places. You are welcome, that you just allow us space to take a deep breath, to ready our minds and our bodies and our hearts and our spirits to receive the word this evening. And Lord, um, just have your way. Just have your way. I just put the cross before me. Heavenly Father, just um, you show up and you do what you do through me. Um, and I thank you for the opportunity. Um, and Lord, I, I love you. I love you. That's it. Uh, and I thank you for everything that you're going to do in each of these homes this evening. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'll pop in. I want to take this moment and say happy Father's Day to all the dads. Um, and I want to thank you for showing up every day. Thank you for uh, being present. Thank you for being our safe spaces. Thank you for being our leaders. Thank you for keeping in faith. Just thank you for being dad. And, and that looks like that looks different for everybody, but thank you. We love you. We appreciate you. We celebrate you. Um, and you just keep doing what you're doing, right? Right. And you just keep letting God use you and you keep taking up space and you just 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 keep honoring that position. And I pray just a, a special blessing on you this Father's Day season. So nothing will. So we started off in uh, Romans 8, 38, and we talked about how nothing is going to keep us from the love of God, right? We we went into the message version of uh, Romans 8.38 and to summarize everything, for the most part, nothing will. Not, not demonic things, not things that are to come, not things that have passed, not things that have been given thought to, even things that are not even reality as of yet will keep us from the love of God, right? So this week, though, we're going to kind of settle in on it. It was kind of an umbrella session last week. We're going to settle in and talk about Stephen. And we're going to talk about eternal life, right? We're going to settle in on Acts 7, 54 through 60. Neither death nor life, persecution. The big idea is even when faced with intense persecution, we can show love for our enemies because God love has been shown to us. And again, the character analysis is Stephen. And kind of before we move too far forward, uh, I just want to paint a little bit of a background for you. Um, I think Acts 6 verses 1 through 15 is very important to this lesson so that there's a full comprehension and understanding of what's really taking place. So if you would like to turn to the word and follow along, that's fine. If you do not, you want to just sit back and listen, that's cool too, because I'm actually going to read it. Okay, so number six. Um, not number six, Acts 6, 1 through 15 says, the number of disciples was increasing. The Hellenistic Jew Jews among them complained um, against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were not being, their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. So brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip and, and some other gentlemen, because I know I'm going to wreck their names, so please forgive me. <laughs> Prochorus, uh, Nicanor, Timon, Par Parmenius, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostle who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now Stephen, a man full of God's power, 
and grace performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose around, arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen. Jews of Cyrene uh, and Alexandria, the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak blas the blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law, they seized Stephen and brought him before the Sahedrin, which is high court, and they produced false witnesses who testified. This, this fellow never stopped speaking against his holy, this holy place and against the law, but we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth would destroy this place and change the customs of Moses handed down to us all who were sitting in the Sahedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was like an angel. Okay, so the first thing we want to consider as we read Acts 6 through 1 and 5, that there are some things that come along with persecution, right? Again, Stephen is being accused of blasphemy. So when persecution comes, so does the spirit of petty. You know, God needs people to do ministry and so does the adversary need people to persecute. That's why the word says is it, we don't pray against the people. We pray against those things we can't see. We pray against the spirits and principalities. Those are the things that have oppressed the individual so that they are moving in, in the way that they're moving, right? In, in contradiction to who God says, um, they are. Okay, there we go. So for this week, the stoning of Stephen. So in Acts 7, 54, 60, it says, when the members of the Sahedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And at, at this, they covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices, and all rushed him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So the things I want you to consider here, the things that are important are, again, the enemy needs people to carry out his mission, right? But God, again, is a great strategist. He's a phenomenal project manager. He has set up and put some things in place so that even in this terrible situation, everyone wins, right? So he, Stephen was, made his speech denouncing, um, well, they accused him that he made a speech denoun denouncing the Jewish authorities who were sitting in judgment. But interesting fact about this is we talk about as Stephen is being stoned, there was someone else who was rising up and it was this young man named Saul. This particular Saul is very important because this Saul eventually becomes Paul, right? A Pharisee and a Roman citizen who will later become a Christian apostle. He participated in Stephen Stoney. So not only when persecution comes is the spirit of petty available and that there are people that we know that will, will, will be captured up in this. Um, but there will also be um, people that will have one frame of mind during your persecution. But as the Holy Spirit begins to move, and perhaps even as he honors your prayers, as he honors Stephen, 
that these, these people who are persecuting you will be caught up in the spirit and will be transformed. We talked about last week that the living word is meant to be paired with lived experiences so that we become transformed. That's why the word is never old fashioned. It's a very relevant word for every decade that it, that it has been spoken, right? It has truth and it keeps going. We don't have to change it. Um, I know there are different variations uh, of the word of God, but truthfully, as we study, as we get still, it's not necessary to change the word. The word is going to do what the word is supposed to do because the mouthpiece of the word is the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit has come to help us, right? Look at Stephen. He is this man who is full of grace and, and, and power and he's doing works and wonders. Why? Because he has invited the Holy Spirit to dwell within him. The Holy Spirit will only move as far as you allow him to move, much like God will only do what you allow God to do. And if your mind and your heart is um, a heart of stone or you have limited beliefs or you don't believe God is everywhere and is very present in all situations, then you limit his capacity to perform wonders. It's not him. He's still very much God. He can do, he can do it, whatever it is. But we have to think of, we have to break out of our own silo of thinking and we have to give God his space and his position back. And we do have to understand that when there, when persecution comes, it comes for various reasons. These, these people, these men started this, 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 this um, rumor out of jealousy and when we can we can read at the last end of chapter 6 of uh, verse 15 14 15 because I'm not looking at it you know it made mention that he had a voice he had a face of an angel <laughs> and I kind of laughed at that when I read it because I was like they hated on this man because he was fine right he was nice looking you know, he, he, it was something pleasing about him. There was a glow about him. And those who didn't possess that were jealous of, of his gift set, his toolbox, if you will, right? And if you go back and do a deeper analysis of Stephen, Stephen was a fairly young man. It's estimated that he was only between the 28 and 33. And so as I was reading this and I was thinking about just life, what was happening you know he was given this ministry to minister to these widows he, he's probably a very friendly person too because if you've been around old folks old folks are funny and old women are real funny um especially widowed women right because you know they, they've had to build up a wall perhaps to succeed and and to continue on in life and they, there's a strength about them right their brokenness uh, produces a strength a special kind of oil. And so <laughs> Stephen had to be a people person. He had to be kind and genuine. Otherwise, I don't care if you bring your food by or not, you can drop the basket at the door and keep on pushing. Is is I know some old women who would do that, right? Or some older women or some widowed women, young and old for that matter. But he had a demeanor about him full of grace and he was able to navigate people really easily and very well. But yet he was persecuted because of this jealousy. Um, it, you know, they started this rumor. And I can't help but think, what would have happened if somebody had stood up for Stephen? Would his ministry continue to flourish? But of course, we can't answer that because Stephen did. Um, he, he went on to be with God. So I want you to think about those moments when you were persecuted. And we talked about this a little bit last week. You know, when someone is throwing stones at us, sometimes there's often this cognitive dissonance and there's this confusion. We don't always understand why it is happening, right? And so as those stones are thrown at us or things are said about us, we inherently, because we're human beings and having a human experience, We'll begin to build a wall with the stones that are being thrown at us. And if you can imagine for a moment, if you are this person and you've been persecuted and you keep building this wall up and you can imagine all these rocks around you, imagine the things that you're keeping out. 
imagine the things that are taking root. Like last week, we talked about a little bit about bitter roots, that there's something that sours on the inside because, in, in, because of the hurt, we grow downward instead of upward and outward right? We we're supposed to be trees planted by the rivers of water. That means we're supposed to grow out and we're supposed to uh, provide shade and we're supposed to provide sustenance and season, right? But if that doesn't happen, if there's no water that gets to our roots, then, then that doesn't happen. That does it. And, and we're just like this little, this little weed, you know, surrounded by all these rocks and we might get a trickle of something every now and again. <clears throat> And, and this is also where our heart gets hardened, right? And, and we, we make judgments against the person who is persecuting us. That's not what God would have us to do because in making that judgment a against the person who is persecuting us, we're gonna reap that very judgment. The word even says, judge not, least be judged. That means the thing that you judge in someone else's life, you will reap it in yours. And you sit there and think about it for a moment as a young man or a young father or a young person or a young lady, and you made a judgment because there was not complete understanding of the situation. Did you not find yourself later in life in a similar situation? Don't judge, at least you be judged. Don't judge because judging is still sowing and you are planting something in your heart and it is going to run the course and is going to bear fruit because the thoughts that you are having are not God's thoughts. The, God, the thoughts that you are having are thoughts of self-sustainability. And this is where my heart landed last week with children. Sometimes it's children because our parents are trying to protect us from things. We are aware that our parents may be unhappy, that there might be friction or there's something is going on somewhere in the community. And we make these judgments. Oh, I'm not going to, when I get older, you're not going to treat me like that. You, you, you're not going to do that. I'm not going to put up with that. Right. But we, we, now we're made an inner vow inside of, inside of ourselves. And if that's not unearthed, we carry that with us and it begins to evolve and it shows up. Is, is the stinky fruit in life that we don't want. And as we revisit this, think about how persecution is threefold. It is spiritual, it is physical and external, and it's emotional and internal. We talked about last week how the definition of persecution is not just annoyance or harassment, but it's imprisonment. You know, those internal thoughts, those, those negative self-talk, turn inward produces anxiety and anxiety is internal terrorism. And in it, if you ever feel like you can't control an aspect of that, that's when, that's usually when you have a, um, a breakdown, that's usually when um, you silo yourself even more because of the hurt. It, it is a misplace of feeling during a time when you did not have a mature understanding or even a relevant one of what was happening around you. And again, um, we see clearly with Stephen's testimony that we have the ability to um, pray for our enemies. You know, the enemy's intent for persecution and, and its purpose is designed to place doubt in your spirit so that you will take your eyes off the promise of God. It's designed so that you will sow a wrong judgment in your life, make an inner vow, and begin to place more value on flesh control, fleshly control, and self-sustainability than trusting the sustainer. <coughs> Excuse me. We see with Stephen that we have the ability to respond differently with the help of the Holy Spirit and being aligned with God, our persecution is a catalyst for purpose and new position in Christ. I said last week that God is a great strategist and he is all seeing, all knowing and ever present in our life. And he always has one last move because the adversary's vision is clouded and limited. Whereas the God we serve is a limitless God. 
the adversary's wisdom and knowledge is limited, but the person who created you has is limitless, right? He always has the last move. There was, um, I had a friend of mine send me this video um, of this pastor who gave a sermon about this wonderful piece of art. I want to say it was in the Louvre. I could be wrong. But anyway, it, it was about this game between angel, a chess game between an angel and the devil, right? And um, there was a gentleman that was in the crowd. And as he was... Um, looking at this picture he called over the curator and said to him this is interesting you know because of the title the, the title alluded to that somehow the enemy had won but this master game smith or game master or chessman was looking at the board and understood it strategically and whereas, uh, you know, the, the angel felt some kind of way and the, the adversary is a little puffed up in this picture, the gentleman who had um, inside knowledge of the game said, it's interesting because there's one last move on the game board. You know, God is that kind of God. No matter what situation that you're in, there was one last move. There is one last move. Do you understand me? He controls it all. It is slanted. The game of slant, the game of life is slanted so that you come out as a victor. No matter how you start, you have infinite possibilities to end victoriously. And your character will be tested, but you still have the upper hand. So what are some other things that we, we, have, we can take away from Stephen's um, life and, and this little uh, quip that we see? We see that we have a very present help from the Holy Spirit, very present help. And, and if the Holy Spirit is not working and is not a daily part of your life, then all you have to do is invite him in, right? Right? You just have to invite him in. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. You are welcome here. I said something the uh, other day in prayer. And because I do, I, I personally, I'm an anxious personality, right? There is something in psychology. My undergrad is in psychology and counseling. Um, and I've done a lot of study on marginalized communities, especially children. And there's a thing called ACEs, and it's called Adverse Childhood Experiences. And there's 10 primary ACEs. And statistically speaking, if you have four of, of these experiences, then, you know, there, there are things that you're going to experience. Life will be a lot harder. If you have five, then life is a lot harder as far as navigating life and jobs or whatever else. But if you have six, Statistically, they say that you are 60% more likely to commit suicide. I have seven. I have seven. And I recently said that in an interview when they asked me, why is this important to you? And I shared with them because people have to see that the love of God is real and that there are people who come from the same neck of the woods and the same hood who have survived and they are happy and they are thriving and they are still going through the evolutionary process. It is important that they hear I did, you can too. If you're thinking about the various characters in the word, there's interracial relationships, there are people from different places, there are opposing points of view. It is very much a relevant word. Something else I want you to remember is that when the Holy Spirit lives within us, we have the ability to perform signs and wonders. We have the ability, we can lay hands on people, we can assist in the deliverance. We can be the conduit that God uses, the thing that the Holy Spirit flows through. I know each of you have, must have had some experience while in your years of serving, um, serving the kingdom. 
We also look at Stephen and we see him while being stoned. It hurts and it's overwhelming. We have the power to command our flesh to surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. You know, when people say, well, that's just the way I am. Nope, that's the way you're choosing to be. Because God says, I have authority over my mind, my thoughts, and my mouth, and my flesh. So sometimes when it hurts so bad that it burns, like Paul said, right, I can still command my flesh to surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit, and I can still do what is right and not do what is worldly. We live in the world. We're not of the world. We live in it, but we don't have to reflect it. And especially when we have a crossover moment, when we give our life to Christ, then we are transformed. You know, Stephen went on to be glory, to glory. He's ultimately been reunited with the person who has created him. He's been transformed. There is always a transformation. The closer we get to God and there's always elevation, the closer we draw to him as well. And in persecution, be mindful of your words and what is released from your heart via your mouth, you have the authority to release blessings. You have the authority to re release blessings. Or you know what? You also have the authority to release death. Life and death comes from the tongue. You can usher somebody to life or you can escort them to their, their demise. Ultimately, is a mindset. It is a heart navigation system. What are you doing? Do you ask the Lord to chase, chase in your mouth? Do you ask him? I did share with pastor, um, I don't know, maybe a week or so ago that um, I was irritated, right? Irritated. And, and I was in a mood and that day the enemy had his foot on my neck and I realized the foot was on my neck. And the only thing I could say was I can't let go of my tongue because God would not be pleased. In my mind, I had to acknowledge it first. And once I got to the point where I was able to acknowledge it, then the victory for the rest of the day was a lot easier because I was sitting there frustrated. But in the Holy Spirit of present hell, he sent hell. He sent someone to say, hey, how's your day? Oh, this is where I'm at, transparently speaking, right? Then I was able to move forward in victory and in faith. So with that, be careful who is around you and who you are sharing your heart with. It is important that you have people that will keep your feet to the fire because they know that you are a gem and you are going through it and they want you to be victorious, Another great point is like Stephen and his ministry for the widows, you have a ministry. You have a ministry, whether it's teaching, preaching, laying on hands, whatever it is, you have a ministry. Cookie, hugs and high fives. All these kids, I just saw one today and he, he's got to be a foot taller than I am now. And, and when I started coaching him, he was playing basketball, my basketball team, he was probably a foot shorter than I was. But he walked over to me and said, Coach, Coach Hill. And I, my head went up and I was like, get out of here, right? Whatever your ministry is, hugs and high fives. And I couldn't help myself because I was being authentic and I stretched out my arms and I hugged this young man and, and gave him a high five. Why? Because authentically, that's who I am. Do you know how many times in my life that a hug has led to great conversation and has given me an opportunity to usher someone to Christ? You have a ministry. And if you don't know what your ministry is or you need some clarification, I would encourage you to get still and have a conversation and ask. Miles Monroe many years ago had this um, sermon that he did and he talked about prayer. But one of the points that really stuck out to me was that in prayer, we do a lot of talking, but we don't do a lot of listening. Make sure in your prayer time that you, you have time to listen. 
that everything is turned off or whether it's your music that's on, but you have time to listen and that you are intentionally focusing and expecting God to speak to you through the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit is empowered in our lives, we are transformed into new creatures, beings, and ambassadors for the gospel. Believe that wholeheartedly. And when the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, I'm sorry, uh, God releases his super on our natural. And when this happens, the supernatural occurs. Faith without works doesn't produce anything. It has to be faith and works. You have to have faith, but you got to do something. You can't be the man at the fountain, laying by the fountain all these years. You could have rolled over into the water and got up and walked away. At some point, you got to pick up your mat, the thing that's bothering you. You got to pick up your faith and let it spur you on. You got to take a step. You got to make a decision. You got to do some things that people don't understand because it ain't about them. It's about you and the Lord because God is doing something to you so that you fulfill your purpose. You got to pick up your mat and walk. But you got to remember that nothing is going to separate you from the love of God. You got the Holy Spirit. You have the blood of Jesus. You have meditation. You have prayer. You have faith and works. But you have a God that would do exceedingly abundantly more that you can ask or think. He will meet you where you are. He has given you the ability to multiply and be fruitful. He has given you this instruction manual that is full of good, deep, rich instruction and an insight that if you sit down and you really read it just a little bit at a time, you will begin to see strategies and techniques that are going to help you in any situation that you are in, in life, because it's nothing but a vapor. It's going to be over sooner than later, but it can be what you desire it to be if you're willing to go through the process. Okay. So I guess my question right now is we end with this part of the lesson and go into the second part of the lesson is one, is the Holy Spirit a very real helper to you? And two, do you ask him to help you on, on a frequent basis? Do you have real conversations? And say, hey, I need you to help me. Not those pious high church ones. I think we talked about this several weeks ago when Minister Jamie was talking about um, uh, different facets of, of life. And she it was a conversation about fathers. And sometimes we, we can't get past the religious part of faith to get to the real part of things. And I had made mention that I sit in the floor sometimes, crisscross applesauce. And I speak to God much like I would have spoken to my father, just plainly and painfully um, uh, direct, right? Because that's who I was, you know, as a child. It was just like, look, this is bothering me. You got a minute? Can you listen? And then I would just spill it all out, right? I, I wasn't one of those kids that would go to her dad and just, you know, every day it was something. No, um, I was a, I'm a deep thinker. I'm a deep thinker and I will get to the point where I'm really full and I have all these questions and daddy would sit on the edge of the bed and he would eye up with me and he would say yes <laughs> and it would come pouring out like a pitcher. I have those same experiences as an adult with God and then I sat there and I wait for him to answer me. So what about you? Do you trust the Holy Spirit? Do you have those conversations? with the way maker, with your advocate, with the very present help that he is according to John 14 and 16. Amen. Uh, Pastor Jamie says, yes, I find myself saying, Father, I don't know what to say. I just need you. That's true. Anybody else? My grandmother told me many years ago, keep on living, honey. Sometimes a moan is all you can muster. 
Um, so I believe that too. I, I, I believe wholeheartedly sometimes when all you can say is Jesus. All you can say, the person who knows you inside and out understands you when you can't speak. Amen, Brother Jeff, Pastor Jeff. So we're going to leave that behind. We're going to make this uh, segue into a question that I have for you. And it is, um, we talk about internal life, right? Nothing will separate us from the love of God, according to Romans 8, 38. Brother Darnell says, sometimes I don't know what to say. And I just cry out and ask the Holy Spirit to hear my heart. Amen. That, that's a wonderful thing. Sometimes people are, are afraid to expose their heart. They feel vulnerable. And they don't know what to do with their vulnerability. And they can't even give that to, to, to him. So that, that is so real. So thank you, everyone, for, for that. So on your deathbed, and you can unmute and you can speak up if you like. On your deathbed, what do you want to say about your life? And I'm asking this question because often people are too scared to talk about death. And we need to. Uh, and in this message or the second half of this message, um, how do you feel about death? I'll say for me, um, what do I want to say about my life? I say that um, at all times I thought I did what I was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. But as I continue this journey with God, I learn from everything that I did mm -hmm. and how he wants me to do it the next time. And that in my death or on my deathbed, I would speak to all or um, in saying that I did what I thought I was supposed to do. But um, I've always asked God to correct the hearts that I may have done wrong in that journey of doing what I thought I was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And um, I just hope that I've learned over it, uh, learned from it, and made better moves, you know, towards the end of my life when I get to that, to my deathbed. Yeah. Amen. I, I think that's a very honest and, and transparent response. Um, Minister Jamie said that's deep, but a real question. She has to ponder. Um, I'm sure Pastor Away says, I want to hear my father to say, well done, good and faithful servant. I just want to carry out the will of my father. Amen. Um, and Jamie says, uh, well done. You know, you know what? Thank you for showing up in that moment. Uh, Minister Darnell, thank you for sharing your heart and everyone else. Um, personally, um, Mr. Um, Teresa, I, I just want to say that um, Thank you for this lesson. Uh, it's, it's, it's very astounding and very well put together. And it has really, I think, uh, provided an opportunity for questions to be pondered within our hearts and within our souls. And uh, so from the very beginning of this lesson, you know, I, I began to get stirred because I, um, I'm a stickler for God's word and what he says about it. And I follow it uh, tremendously on, on, on the teachings. And I noticed that even in your, um, in your uh, illustration here, it shows all the stones that were supposedly been tossed at Stephen, but yet he, was, he or she uh, was just standing there. 
Well, the, the, the takeaway that I got from that is that no matter how much uh, people will stone you or come against you to destroy your life and to kill your life, whether you die or live is up to you. Amen. Uh, Stephen, if we notice the reading uh, while they were stoning him, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, receive my spirit. And I take that away because a lot of times, even when you go to funerals, they'll say, and the Lord God took him. God doesn't take anybody. Mm -hmm. He will receive you, but he does not take your life. He's a giver of life and not a taker of life. And so what am I saying here? I'm saying that the stones didn't kill Stephen. Stephen gave God the permission to call his spirit into, the, into his presence. How do I know that? Because Paul, who later, Saul, who later became Paul, was also stoned several times. When you follow his ministry, Amen. you'll find out that Paul was, was, was stoned many times. There was one time they stoned him and they said the disciples uh, gathered around him and they prayed and he got up and walked to the next town. Get out Amen. of here. <laughs> he got up and walked to the next town. Well, because the stones can't kill him. He had to give permission for that threat, for those all of that hate to kill him. And he was not ready for that. You, how do I know he wasn't ready? Because then another scripture says, he says, I'm in, I'm in a, a, a straight between two, whether to leave or to go. In other words, he knew that he had the power himself, whether to stay here or to leave here. Mm -hmm. So we understand, we understand it so much to a certain degree, but we, uh, uh, we, we need to take it deeply in our hearts, especially when we're contemplating this question on your deathbed, where you have to say, you have to say like Paul, with, 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 with strong, uh, with strong, uh, for you know, for, fortitude within yourself to say, I have fought a good fight. Not, I think I did. No, I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. And now what's laid up for me is a life. Well, when I was going through uh, all of that that I went through within this last year, I wasn't ready to go. Amen. <laughs> and I wasn't ready for the Lord to receive me. I kept saying, I got work to do. Amen. I got places to go. I got stuff to say for the kingdom. Amen. Amen. And, uh, so, it, 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 you know, all of us, let me say this right here. We're all on our deathbed. Every day is your deathbed. Well, what do you do with it? Do you continue to live or do you decide to throw in the towel and say, yes, I'm done with this. I am never done with it. <laughs> I'm not done with it until God tells me I'm done with it. And he was my fight. I belong to Christ. I am his. He, he you know, I, I, I belong to him. I'm his. And I, he promised me in his word that he would take care of me. And so I'm going through this fight. It was like my mom. She'd always say, well, we're going to go through this and then we fight what comes up next. But right now we're going to deal with this. So I'm it's like we're gonna deal with this. And then whatever uh, comes up next, we'll deal with that. But right now I'm dealing with this and I'm going to stay here. I would tell God, I want to stay with my, my children. I want to stay with my grandchildren. I want to see the church grow. I want to see the works of my hand, Father. Yeah. And you know what? I'm speaking today. This is my first time back since uh, I went through this sickness probably in several months, but I have enjoyed this lesson tremendously. And my deathbed message would be this, what I say every day, I fought a good fight. Come on. I, a fight. I did my best. I was stoned many times, but I got up and walked to the next time. Amen. Amen. You, we can all just get up and walk Amen. to the next time because the enemy cannot hold us back Neither can the enemy take your life. It's up to you whether you go or whether you stay. Bless every one of you, uh, uh, Minister Teresa. I've enjoyed the lesson tremendously. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Yes, thank you <laughs> for, for showing up. Well, anyway, so she pretty much summed up the rest of the lesson. <laughs> it was wonderful and much needed. I know I feel... Um, 
gosh, I feel I feel so very encouraged. Um, but really, the text for the second half was Re Revelation 21, 1 through 8. Nor things present or things to come, eternal life. And the big idea is um, eternal life filled with peace, hope, happiness is promised to those who follow Jesus. Right? You is it, it is what it is. You can't change it. The enemy can't change it. It is going to happen, right? Oh, man. So, um, and again, Revelation 21, 1 through 8 is on your screen. Uh, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared uh, and prepared a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God is dwelling, look, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God and he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who has seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. And those who are victorious will inherit all this. And I will be their God and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and liars, uh, they will be consigned to the lake of fire or the lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Um, so Mother Teresa says, in light of the heaven, in light of heaven, the worst suffering on earth, a life full of the most atrocious tortures on earth will be seen to be no more serious than one night in an inconvenient hotel. Ooh, that is amazing. That's it. When we get to the end, we have run our race and we're finished and we're ready to, to uh, transcend or ascend uh, like Stephen, like Enoch, like so many others. Yes, in the end, it, it, it's, it's not going to be no, it's not going to be a big thing, you know? So we're going to end there because I feel like everybody is in a great place. And like I said, um, Apostle uh, Edna uh, brought on home. She said, really, you have free will. You have the will and the power to choose. Are you going to keep going? Or are you not? You're going to fold? Are you going to hold? Are you going to run? Right? I think it's Kenny Rogers' old country song. But anyway, um, but that's the truth. What you want to do? What are you going to do with your light? How are you going to proceed in this life? And, and if you proceed, know that you have a plethora of help. Know that it's ever present. And know that it's only a spoken word away or a moan there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God I don't care what you've been through in your life I don't care what you've done I don't know what you've done in your ignorance I don't know what you've done in your transformation process or your early days as a follower of Christ I don't even know what you do now but the bottom line is this you are loved deeply and on purpose so nothing is going to separate you from the love of God. So tonight, this week, this day, settle that in your spirit. Nothing will. Nothing will. You keep your eyes on him. He's going to reach for you, hold you, speak to you, lead you, eye up with you. Nothing is going to separate you from the love of God. If you stay in pace or you decide that you're on a good wind and, and you walk uh, before him for a season, right? Is he supporting you on your journey? Nothing's going to separate you from the love of God. He's going to step back and say, that's mine. 
she's mine, he's mine. And if you find yourself downtrodden, you're still his. He's still sitting at the edge of your bed or at the chair at your kitchen table on the couch next to you. He's just waiting to say, he's just waiting to hear you re-invite him into your life. Nothing is going to separate you from the love of God, right? So we're going to close in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to grow in grace and wisdom and strengthen our, uh, strengthen, um, our lens of your limitless love for us. Holy Spirit, have your way with each of us. Meet us in our fears, our uncertainty, and magnify our willingness to be bold and live on purpose and in love for your glory and for the edification of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, thank you. We collectively celebrate what a wonderful God you are and will continue to be in each other's lives and the lives of our enemies and the lives of those we love. I thank you, Lord, for showing up every day on purpose. I thank you for making a way. I thank you even when I haven't asked the question, you often present the answer because you know my heart. Lord, I thank you for this season of my life. I thank you for the ability to walk through persecution. And I thank you for the ability to stand in you. And I appreciate you sometimes when I couldn't walk that you carried me, Lord. You carried me until I had strength to, to stand back up on my feet. You loved me so much that you carried me in a season. You provided me provided for me in a season. You took care of the people that I loved. You gave me space to heal, Lord, as you've given space to each and every one of these families here today. God, I thank you. Have your way, Heavenly Father. I ask that the hosts that have been assigned to each of the homes represented at Launch, represented at Launch Church will be kept safe, that the needs are met this week, and that there will be a mighty outpouring of your presence, that renewal of hearts and minds and purpose of your children will take place this week, Lord. Father, I plead the blood of Jesus over each and every one of them, that no weapon formed against them will prosper, that Lord, as the weapon is being prospered, that they have full confidence, that they have the strength, the ability ability and they have a great advocate who will see them through Lord and that they would trust you Lord I pray that you pour a press down overflowing favor upon each and every one of these people tonight Lord that if they are struggling with a broken heart that you will heal it if there are needs that are unmet that you would meet them that Lord that you will increase our capacity for you and for the word in our life and Lord, that you increase our territory. You know where we are called to minister and what sphere of impact that you have purposed our feet and our testimony and our lives to beat back the enemy in. Lord, let us be bold and charge it with great confidence. Let us celebrate togetherness because collectively, collectively, we are taking back what has been stolen. Father, in the name of Jesus, this evening, we call from the north, south, east, and west. Every person who was supposed to fill the pews at Launch Church International, yes. or send them, let them feel the love and the light beaming from the cracks and crevices and just from the block in which that church sits. Lord, I thank you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we agree that the people who will fill the place will be divine helpers and there yes. will be a place where they will be divinely healed. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that mm -hmm. we are going to fulfill our kingdom assignment. Yes, Lord. Lord. We surrender and we're ready to hear from you. So thank you for your faithfulness. We love you. And in Jesus' name, what has been decreed has been well established and it is done. Amen. Amen.